Oh my god, YouTube drama is just not my thing. I totally had other plans for my first video of 2020. I was going to either talk about the first season of Sex Education or I was going to compare and contrast this scene from season 4 of Scum. Prøv å gå en dag med hijab, så skjønner du at de fleste nordmenn er nazister. Det er bullshit. With this scene from the L word Generation Q. Fuck these people. Fuck these people. On January 2nd, 2020, I was just making my way down the streets of downtown Seattle. I look at my phone and I'm like, what the hell is this? What has landed in my sub box? Is 100 minute video of this woman getting trashed. ContraPoints released a video on cancel culture and I watched it six times. It's nothing has occupied my mind ever since. I since went ahead and I watched that James Charles video because I didn't watch it back when it was actually relevant because I didn't care at the time. I looked into the death of August Ames. I conducted my own investigation on Buck Angel, Lana Wachowski, and Ilsa Strix. And I found the Spanish version of that Rolling Stone article from the Wayback Machine. I read that article on trashing. I did not read the books that Natalie recommended, though I have a book that I can recommend to you guys. It is called Seven Blind Mice by Ed Young. It is a children's book. Read it to your children. Read it to yourself. It's very, mm, very insightful. So there are these seven blind mice. They come across something new in their ponds. They do not know what it is. And they cannot agree on whether or not it's a pillar, a snake, a spear, or a cliff, or a fan, or a rope. But then one mouse decides to do a more thorough investigation and that is the mouse that figures out that this thing is an elephant and then the other mice they all conduct their own thorough investigations and they all agree that it is an elephant and what is the moral of the story you cannot fit the entire elephant in a single fucking tweet you just cannot you cannot, you cannot express an idea with a bunch of disclaimers, backing up what your idea is, and then making sure that nobody misreads your idea. Hey, I meant X, but I did not mean Y, Z, L, M, N, O, P. Please don't read that into my tweet. You, you just can't do that, but you can do that with YouTube. So when ContraPoints was canceled over the pronoun tweet, I found it very odd because she made an entire video all about pronouns and some of the things that she was saying in the tweet, she said those things in the video, but you get actual context. Anyway, Lexander made a very good video about the pronoun tweet if you're interested in watching that. There's also this tweet and I can see how that read by itself does look bad, but again, she talked about that in the pronoun video. Sometimes you assume somebody's gender based off of their gender expression, but it doesn't always match up the way you would expect it to. So you really can't just rely on the way a person looks, because there's a lot of situations where the way they look doesn't tell you the whole story. Natalie mentioned in her video on canceling that she doesn't think, one, that the people who are mad at her on Twitter watch her videos and... I imagine that might be true. Also that she doesn't think that they're gonna watch this video because it's so long, they're gonna make fun of the length. People are asking for summaries because they don't have the time or the energy to watch a 100 minute video. And I'm like, oh, if you have enough time to spread hate or misinformation or jump to conclusions and then disregard everything else that doesn't match up with your conclusion as fake news, you have enough time to watch the video. I can imagine what the summary is gonna be that's just gonna further piss people off. The video is 100 minutes long. Maybe 10% of it at most is spent actually apologizing for the tweets, but some she just provides context for why she tweeted what she tweeted. And she doesn't even apologize for working with Buck Angel. In fact, she doesn't think that Buck Angel is irredeemably bad. And she also says that what happened between Buck Angel, Lana Wachowski, and Elsa Strix was their business. And it happened like over a decade and a half ago. 
most of the video is about how the unwarranted and excessive and abusive messages are a lot more damaging than uh, the fact that she asked Buck Angel to read a quote for 10 seconds. Oh yeah, and there are about 25,000 comments on that video and they range from either dragging her in Danish, dragging Twitter.com, dragging cancel culture, and saying how much they love her channel and how much it's helped to them. So I think that people who have already canceled her, who are not interested in watching the video anyway, they're just going to continue canceling and not watch the video. Now going back to my elephant metaphor, I can understand if you go up to that elephant, you touch a tusk and you feel spear and you've been attacked by spears before and somebody tells you, no, just go up to it again. It's not really a spear. You just need to feel around more. You're not gonna be inclined to do that. I get it, but I do definitely think that it's important to be more thorough and to investigate before completely writing somebody off and for writing off anybody who continues to be fans of that person. Some people believe that Natalie is a transmedicalist because she worked with somebody for all of 10 seconds who is believed to be a transmedicalist. She made this video called Trans Trenders, which is half an hour long, but it is a fictional debate between Baltimore, Maryland, who I swear to God needs to come back in more videos, and Tiffany Tumbles. We learned a little bit more about Tiffany Tumbles' backstory back in the Tiffany Tumbles video. She is a trans medicalist now. Early on in her transition, she tweeted something problematic and then trans Twitter completely canceled her. I had just come out as trans and I was putting myself out there online and then like that, the trans community dropped me like a piece of trash and I had no support, nothing. I was absolutely alone. Do you have any idea what that felt like? Your leftist allies are not your friends, Adria. One wrong move and you're dead to them. Those are not friends. That's such an insightful thing for her to say. And we learn in the transgenders video that the reason why she clings to transmedicalism because she needs some sort of explanation to give to cis people so that she can gain their acceptance. And she doesn't think that she can get a cis person's acceptance if she doesn't have a theory. And if that means throwing people like Baltimore, Maryland or Adria under the bus, so be it. That's why I like ContraPoint so much. I feel like she does a very good job of trying to understand why people are the way they are. And I think that's what helps change people's minds. So when this whole Buck Angel controversy happened, I was... I already knew about the first time that she got canceled because she was talking to the wrong people. The point is that sometimes people who seem ignorant or hateful just need to be given a non-judgmental space to learn and grow and think. And to just condemn them as hopeless bigots actually prevents that growth from happening. Not all marginalized people want to do that. Not everybody wants to provide a space for people to learn and grow. Some people just want to live their lives that's completely okay, but if somebody says, hey, I'm going to provide that non-judgmental space so that you could learn and grow, that's fucking awesome. That should be encouraged. Again, not to the point where we're discouraging people who just want to live their lives, but oh my god, if somebody wants to educate, that's great. But anyway, with Buck Angel, I didn't have an opinion on him before this controversy happened. And when everybody was saying that, you know, he's so problematic and that he had outed Lana Wachowski and he could have gotten her killed, I didn't even second guess that. And it makes me feel really bad. I found an article from 2003 that was already speculating on whether or not Lana Wachowski was transitioning. It didn't mention Buck Angel at all because other people in Lana's life had come forward and talked about other times when she had cross-dressed. And then I found the article from the Wayback Machine. It's in the Wikipedia reference links. Buck Angel was describing his relationship with Lana and the first day he met Lana, she was wearing women's clothing. So he pointed that out. What I had in mind was like the Nikki tutorial situation. I thought that that's what he did to Lana. I didn't see that in the article that I read. Maybe they were reading other articles. Okay, I am a horrible detective. 
I looked at that article from 2003 and no, it did not mention Buck Angel at all, but it did mention Jake Miller and I didn't even, I should have looked up if Buck Angel went by any other names. His name is Jake Miller. Here's like the damning sentence from that article. And you might say, maybe he didn't tell the press the full story. Maybe he just handed them a single puzzle piece for this picture that they were already piecing together. But that's still problematic. He didn't start the fire, but he intentionally or probably unintentionally fanned the flames a little bit. To that, I say two things. Thankfully, Wanda Wachowski survived this ordeal. She is still alive and well, and she has the ability to speak for herself. If she felt at all victimized in any way by Buck Angel and she wants us all to know about it and she's so angry at him that she cannot resolve this with Buck Angel privately, she needs the entire internet to get angry on her behalf and be so angry with him that not only is he canceled, but anyone who associates with him, even for 10 seconds, is canceled and then all of her friends are canceled. Anybody who sends a heart to her friends, canceled. I don't think that Twitter.com should be the one to decide that. I think that Lana Wachowski can decide how offended she is by that particular incident and how offended we all should be in turn. But my second point is that if you can see what Buck Angel did as this horrible act of violence because he put her in danger, he could have gotten her killed. Can't you see how dangerous all of this is? It just doesn't make any sense to me that Twitter.com decided it was okay to harass and demonize and be very emotionally abusive to a trans woman all in the name of trans rights. It's if you can be outraged by what happened a decade and a half ago, wouldn't you be more outraged by what's happening now? Like what are these standards? They don't make any sense. But I will say that the video was very good. I'm very excited for the sequel. She says she wants to look into more why canceling happens. What are the solutions for that? But also, I'd like to point out, I think that canceling, it has a very social justice type of connotation, at least for me. Canceling is not criticism. It is not holding someone accountable. It is an attack on a human being. In this video, I use the word canceling more or less synonymously with what feminist Joe Freeman, author of The Bitch Manifesto, calls trashing. But this problem of not just being able to criticize somebody's actions, but who they are as a person and completely demoralizing them is a big problem when I grew up Christian because you're not supposed to yoke yourself with non-believers. You're not supposed to talk to people who don't think exactly the way that you do. You can tell them what to think, but you cannot listen to them in turn. But after I left Christianity, the first internet community that I joined was the atheist community. To go back to the elephant metaphor, you wouldn't have a god saying, oh, you can only feel this part of the elephant. You cannot feel around and come to a different conclusion than the one that I gave you. So if you were an atheist, there would be nothing stopping you from feeling the entire elephant and coming to the conclusion that it is in fact an elephant. But I discovered that that was wrong because a lot of people that I came across were super arrogant. It was very important for them to be right in every argument. They were very hostile and very quick to demonize people who thought differently than them. It's not like, oh, you have different ideas from me. I'm very interested in knowing how you came to that conclusion since it's so different from the conclusion that I came to. I didn't see that shit. They were more interested in destroying, but when I was in high school, they didn't call it destroying their opponent. They said pwned. They pwned the other person by almost embarrassing them for even having the wrong opinion to begin with. So they were not receptive to new ideas when new ideas came their way. There's this idea, I think, within our culture not to talk about controversial things. You don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion. And I didn't talk about those things in real life, except with people who already agreed with me. But then I went on the internet and it was just a free-for-all and it just became this big food fight. And I think it would have been so much better if instead of saying, hey, don't talk about controversial things, 
if it would have been, you can talk about controversial things. In fact, I encourage you to talk about those things because it's important to build understanding. But here is some guidance on how to talk about controversial topics while being respectful, how to talk about controversial things in a more productive way, because then it wouldn't come down to tonage. And you know, when I think of something like Gamergate, when I think of Anita Sarkeesian, that's a person who's been trashed. I recently rewatched a video by Sean. He went through Anita Sarkeesian's video and he put in extra context that, um, you know, Thunderfoot had conveniently left out. There were so many comments on that video like, oh my god, I had no idea that Anita Sarkeesian was a normal person with normal and reasonable ideas. She's so different from the image of her that I had in my mind. And I think that that's part of the issue that when we trash somebody or cancel them, we create this very cartoon version of them in our minds. And it's about our cartoon version of them and not about what they actually do or say. But another issue is passive morality. In the trashing article, she talked about it being some sort of like negative competition. I was first introduced to the idea of passive morality from the 2001 movie Chocolat. It used to be my favorite movie like 15 years ago because of this speech at the end of the movie. Listen, here's what I think. I think we can't go around measuring our goodness by what we don't do, by what we deny ourselves, what we resist, and who we exclude. It's just so paralyzing to think of morality in the sense of thou shalt not. What else could cause canceling? Definitely entertainment. Again, I mentioned how I just now watched the James Charles video, but oh my god, I was like, this is more entertaining than any soap opera that I've ever seen. And that's fucked up because that caused a lot of emotional distress for James Charles. But I'm like, I'm horrible that I found this whole thing entertaining. I screen capped a lot of quotes that I thought were very interesting from the trashing article. Joraine pointed out that trashing was a bigger problem with more radical circles because you're going to be very angry because you're oppressed. But how can you vet that anger? You can't do it with the men in your lives because the men in your lives have more power than you. And how can you fight the patriarchy? It's just this huge elusive problem that you don't even know where to start. It's just so overwhelming to think about. But the women in your life, they are the easiest and the safest target. So that's just displacement. She noticed that trashing is less of a problem where people have attainable short-term goals. They're working towards things and they're actually getting things done. If we have clear goals that are obtainable and we work together at achieving those goals, that's a much better solution than cancel culture, right? I think we've got to measure goodness by what we embrace what we create and who we include. Natalie says that all of this abuse that she's experiencing, it doesn't come across as abuse to the people who are perpetuating it. And I think that's because they don't actually believe that they have any real power. You have power that you weren't already aware of. And so if you ever feel very hopeless and feel very helpless, you can remember that instead of using that power for something destructive and use it for something constructive. So I did really like the video. It caused me to reflect a lot. Like I said, talking about YouTube drama, not my thing at all. I'm not making a habit of talking about other YouTubers. I guess I'll go back to talking about fandom shit next time. Yeah, I guess that's all I have for this video. I will talk to you later. I hope you all have a very nice day.